welcome to the Bible class of Jews for Jesus with Bob Mendelson. Well, here we are looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and again, the Apostle Paul is writing to the believers, and he says, we got a couple problems. We've got a couple things where you're doing it wrong, and we've got to get a bigger view than what you've been looking. We've got to get a more heavenly view than an earthly. The first situation has to do with a brother taking a brother to court. He doesn't talk about the instance. He doesn't talk about the particular episode. That is why somebody is suing someone else. But He's saying this should not happen in public. You're taking them to the Corinthian court, to the Supreme Court, to the high court, to the magistrate. You're doing these things in front of unbelievers. Warning, red light, ding, ding, you know, this shouldn't happen. Red flag, this is not right. It's not on. These are two believers who should settle things in a better way than in front of the world. And the second instance has to do with a repeat, if you will, of last week as he's still thinking about chapter 5. Remember, there were no chapter divisions when he wrote his letter, just as when you write letters, you don't think, chapter 4. And so, Mom, (laughs) you just keep writing, right? The second instance has to do with a misuse of your body. So those are our two sections in tonight's Bible reading. And it is significant, I think, as believers find one another and find the world influencing them. We have, we are designed as believers to influence our world. Is that true? We're supposed to be light in a dark world. We're supposed to be salt to preserve the world. Think about it this way. We're supposed to be icebergs chilling the world, keeping the world cool like a refrigerator. But when the world, like heat, melts you like your iceberg, then you have a choice. You have a decision to make. Am I going to be made wet by, that is, lose my influence by the heat of the world, or am I going to be icing it over? Am I going to be accomplishing what I'm intended to do? Another example, if you're a torch and you're surrounded by more and more blackness, If your torch is bright, you can still make a difference. But when the world darkens and swallows you up and your light fades, it's time to do something about it, to get more batteries, to recharge, to do something. So here he's using, I think, similar imagery as he talks about the effect that we're supposed to have on the world. Don't you know, he says in verse number number two, don't you know that the saints are going to judge the world? And don't you know, verse three, that we are going to judge angels? We have a job to do that's huge and here you are being petty about getting saints are believers we've heard the word saint not in a jewish context most jews don't hear sadikim as saints so that is. But we hear saint applied to St. Matthew and St. Luke and St. Teresa of Avila. So we think it's Catholic, but they borrowed it from Jews. So this is heavenly creatures? Are saints heavenly creatures? Certainly when people are in heaven, they are saints. But saint comes from a single word in Hebrew, sanctify kadosh, the same shoresh of kuf dalad shin. And that means to make holy. So these people are already made holy. That's what a saint is. Those who are already in heaven who now can help us. And I'm going to ask any saint the misunderstanding of saints. See, that's the question. When does somebody become holy? When did you become holy? But when did you become a saint? Or are you? We looked at this at the beginning of 1 Corinthians. He has delivered us, is delivering us, and will yet deliver us. So it is a past tense reality. We are, get it, saints. We have been delivered from our sins. But we need to act like no, Okay. So act saintly. That's another matter. And that's what he's calling us to in this chapter. However, he's not appealing to you because you can, if you do this well, become a saint. He's appealing to the Corinthians because they already are saints. And when do you become a saint? When you are sanctified. So look down at verse number 11 and you'll see such were, past tense, some of you, covetous drunkards, effeminate, homosexuals, etc. But you were washed, past tense, you were sanctified. You have already now become saints. If I used a noun instead of the compound adjective, if you will, you were sanctified. Instead of the verb and made it into a noun, you are saints, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the 
Spirit of our God. It is a done deal. So when he is appealing to the believers in Corinth, he's saying, what are you doing? Suing each other over 40 centimeters of property or over some tort liability that they have that you think that, the, that you want this. And he owns a safer Torah, but it's really ours. He promised you that and you didn't, and he didn't come through. So you take him to court? You are saints. Live above that kind of human enterprise. Isn't it better, he says, if you are wronged? Isn't that a great word? It's better if you are, verse 7, actually, it's already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. Why not dive for the bottom? Why not say, all right, he stole 50 bucks. He stole 50 bucks. Let him live with his 50 bucks. I'm not going to sue him over 50 bucks or 100 kopeck or 3,000 rubles. That's not going to change the world. I'm happy. Let him have it. Who's our example here but Yeshua, who had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, and yet he allowed the justice of the world to take him to the cross and nail him. There are always exceptions and there's always circumstances and we've got to look at all things. We live in a place where Jewish law is not the norm. It was just a couple of years ago. Remember when one Orthodox rabbi and another Orthodox rabbi right here, a spit from here, took each other to court. In Gitin, that's a Talmudic passage, it says, it was taught that Rabbi Tarfun, second century of the common era, used to say, in every place where you find pagan law courts, like Australian, you must not make use of them, even if their laws are the same as the laws of Israel, because the Tanakh says in Mishpatim, these are the judgments, the Mishpatim, which you shall set before them, Exodus 31. Not before the world, but before them, meaning the Jews. So that was their rationale for avoiding going to pagan, read secular courts. The Apostle Paul himself, though he says this, in one circumstance, appealed to a higher court. When he was incarcerated in one town, he said, I appeal to Caesar because he really wanted to get to Rome and preach anyway. So he used the appellate system of the law, of the legal system of Rome, to get himself a free passage, if you will, uh, to go and preach in Rome. Good on him for that. He's not, however, suing another brother. You don't see Sosthenes suing Luke because he didn't get a fair share of the equity market that Paul was running in his scheme. See what I mean? Believers have to act differently in court, in justice. It's one of the three pillars, if you will, three legs of the stool of Jewish life when we go out to the world, one of which is to build a hedge about Torah, but another is to build courts, live in courts. And one of the first of the seven laws of the sons of Noah, which is not in Bible, has to do with make or establish courts and justice. In the book of Numbers, justice, justice shall you pursue, which when the Hebrew repeats, it's amplifying it. Seriously, get into justice. That's what you ought to pursue, which means when you are wronged, you don't sue people. You rather are sue a bull. Better to let somebody have whatever they want. Yeshua said that, didn't he? When the Romans were there and he was teaching about the Sermon on the Mount and people were saying, hey, those Romans, they keep demanding and we're not going to do that. He said, if they demand of you your coat, give them your shirt too. If they want you to go one mile, go with them a couple. Give, expecting nothing in return. That's Yeshua's, not advice, but his law. And if it's his law, then my, oh my, those of us who are saints ought to live in it. I know two Christian organizations that sued and countersued each other in public in the courts. And I think, who's not reading their Bible? Get a third person, get an arbiter, somebody that you can agree with and do it in-house. That's the only way to go. Look, justice is okay, but arguing for your own justice against another brother, I'm not saying you can't sue somebody. Let's say you run a business and somebody, not a believer, just somebody takes on, you know, whatever. They enter into a contract with you and they break the contract. Well, that's a pretty simple and straightforward thing. You take them to court and it's dealt with in a pretty quick fashion. But if it's a believer who's taking another believer to court, you just have to know that's out of bounds. Did he say here, do it undercover, or did he say just let it be? He says both, that if you've got a case against your neighbor, why do you dare to go to law before the unrighteous, and verse 1, not before the saints? So go to a tribunal that's a believer, some arbiter, some threefold, some five, somehow set up courts. We talk a lot about the beginning of community and messianic communities. When we did the book of Acts and we studied it, we saw whenever they went, they established this, that, and the other thing. One of the things that believers do when they travel and set up 
little believing communities is to set up courts, set up a system of justice that is right and whereby people can establish things without the world, as we would call it, noticing. A couple other things are established. One is a child education always is set up when you want to set up a new community. You want to set up a church. You want to set up a synagogue somewhere in Bali, Bora Bora, wherever you're going, and you want to set this up. You have to set up courts. That is some system of justice. you got to set up a child education thing, and you got to find a burial plot. you got to take care of the old, the young, and everybody in between. Then he appeals, though he doesn't explain it in verse 2, though we hear it later on in the rest of Paul's letters, and Jude actually writes about this too, that the saints will judge the world. The world is judged by you. Aren't you competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Verse 2. So it's since you guys are going to run the world and decide who's in and out and be part of Did you know you were going to do that? Did you know you were going to judge the nation? If you're going to do that, can't you sort out getting through or four guys together to sort these things out. We'll judge angels. How much more the matters of this life? So he's appealing to the believers in Corinth to set up their own in-house system to prevent the embarrassment and really the shame of the exposure of injustice being proclaimed instead of justice being proclaimed. Verse 4, don't you appoint them as judges who are of no account in the church? If you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges who are of no account in the church? In other words, appoint guys who are going to make a difference, sensible guys. And in Acts chapter 6, when there was a controversy between the Hellenized, that is Greek-speaking Jews, and the Hebraic, that is the Hebrew-speaking Jews, the widows, well, let's look at it. The community of faith, Acts chapter 6, set up a way to deal with it. Verse 1, at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, they had to deal with a matter of congregational concern. A complaint arose on the part of the Greek-speaking Jews against the native Hebrew-speaking Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of bread. Meals on Wheels was skipping them. So the Twelve summoned the congregation of disciples and says, you know, it's not good for us to neglect the Word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, you select from among you seven men, and they'll be the court. They'll be the magistrates to deal with this issue. Seven men of good reputation full of the spirit, wisdom, whom we may put in charge of the task. We're going to go back to praying and ministering the word. And they said, sounds good. They chose Stephen and six other guys. And these they brought before the apostles. They laid hands on them, anointed them, and made them into, if you will, the first law court. Moses did the same thing. You remember with the elders? That's right. When his father-in-law, Jethro or Ruel, depends on which section you're reading, the father of Zipporah, told him, you've got too many people coming to you for asking questions. Choose some guys who are in charge of guys who are in charge of guys. And he set up a whole court system, an eldership system, so that little matters could be dealt with. And then the big matters, Moses said, I'll take care. So he was the Supreme Court, or the High Court. And lower matters were held by lower matters. So this is sensible. And that's what the apostle is appealing to and that the disciples should have understood here in 1 Corinthians. He says this in verse 5, to your shame. That's a hard thing to write. A couple chapters ago, he said, I'm treating you like you're my children. I'm your father. You don't have many fathers. And fathers shouldn't shame their children publicly, but he's shaming them internally. Does that make sense? He's shaming them in front of each other saying, what are you people thinking of? Why are you not living the way I've taught you? He's not sending a note to the Corinthian morning herald and saying, there are some believers who aren't real. And He's not exposing the church to shame. He's exposing the church of its own shame. You hear the difference? So you can have a family meeting, can't you? And you could say, we got trouble. But you're not going to tell me family trouble. And so, you know, you guys can tell. But at home, you guys have to have discussion and deal with things. And that's right. And a daddy has to tell his kids, this is out of bounds. This is in bounds. I appreciate that. I don't appreciate that. This gives the family a bad name. Well, same thing here in the community of faith called the church. Brother goes to law with brother, and that before unbelievers. I'm shocked, is what he's saying. Why not, verse 7, rather be wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? I try to live in that. I try to live with that. Even in a Messianic Jewish organization, like the Lausanne Consultation on Jewish Evangelism, or Jews for Jesus, or any of the number of Messianic things with which I've been associated, even in the Jewish Christian wing of things, 
people mistreat one another. All right, so they did that. So what am I going to do? Write a note to the Sydney Morning Herald, to the Australian Jewish News? Wentworth is close enough. That's fine. Or am I just going to say, I'll cop it. I'll eat that. I'm going to go to the brother. I'm going to do what Matthew 18 says and try to win my brother back and do the, I was wrong, you wronged me. Let's kind of make this right. And if that doesn't work, bring a couple others with you so that two or three people will be evaluating it. Let's look at this. That's too important to just mention. Matthew chapter 18, verse number 15 and following. If your brother sins, really against you, not if he just sins. If your brother sins against you, go. Show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, woohoo, you've won your brother. Verse 16. But if he doesn't listen to you, don't go to the civil courts. Don't go to the unbelievers. Don't expose this outside. Take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. Get this done, internal church, internal, have a set of courts. Does that make sense? This is Yeshua's words. This is Moses's, Jethro's words. This is the Apostle Paul's words. This is not a new thing. The reason we go to court is because we think we were wronged and we want justice. I play golf about once a week and it's so funny when I play with a guy and he hits a ball and it's wayward as could be. All right, when I hit a ball and it goes wayward as could be and it hits a tree and I can't find it. You know, it's nowhere. And we're walking towards it. And ah, there it is. It's out there. It, it's kicked out into the fairway. And I think, woohoo, this is great. You know? And the next time I hit at the tree, and I hit a great ball right down the right side. Beautiful. It's bending around. And now some weird tree hanging over the fairway hits my ball, knocks it straight down. And I think, ah, almost every guy I play with says, no justice. There's no justice. And I think, you don't say that when your ball goes into the woods and miraculously it pops out. They want. They don't want justice. They just want some kid to follow around and throw the ball into the fairway for them. That's how it works. Justice is getting what you deserve. People really don't want that until they've been wrong. If you know yourself, you know that you deserve mm, justice. True? You know yourself. Look, we just finished... Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, we know Hashem knew, but God, we know that we are worthy of justice and punishment if you're really honest with yourself. So, do you really want to cry for justice? But we're not saved by mercy. But by mercy, by the grace of God. We should be gracious and merciful towards others. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve, like hell. Grace is getting what you don't deserve, like heaven. So when your brother sins against you, go fix it up. I had a fellow who did me some wrong the moment almost I got to Australia. In fact, just before I got here. And it was a terrible thing what he did publicly. And it was in a publication and it was terrible. And it sat and festered for over a decade. It was terrible. He moved here, he moved there. And where he moved, I had an opportunity to fly there and to visit with him. And within five minutes of our meeting together, we were restored. And I think, how much better was this? And we should have done this a decade ago. But for some reason, we went wanted to, why do you live in wrong goodness? Because it's so self-satisfying. Oh, man, do you know how they treated me? We had a guy pop in the shop, didn't we, just before the meeting tonight. And he said, where's your church? And I said, well, we don't have a church, but I gave him the one new man flyer and said he might want to come along. And, of course, it lists Jubilee Church. And he says, oh, I've been there. Uh, But everywhere I go, they harass me. I said, so did they harass you at Jubilee Church? No. (laughs) Obviously not everywhere. But he lives in a victim mentality of being harassed. He knows that as soon as he comes. I'll come to your church. Pretty soon you'll harass me. Harass you for what? To do what? Oh, you try to kick me out. Why would a church kick you out? They want to welcome you. I mean, but here's a guy who's lived in so much of a victim mentality that he has comforted himself, stroked himself. It's almost ridiculous how comforted he is in being wronged. And do you know people who are like that? Who every time you see them start telling you yeah. within a minute yeah. how bad the world is and how the world, his boss just treated me so bad. You know, the bus driver wouldn't even look at me. But Yeshua says, this is how you should get along. If your brother sins against you, go. Get it right. And if he hears you, even if they're wrong. Because when you think you are wronged, 
you've been done wrong to, then you're comforted in that. And you don't want the exposure of truth to that lesson of how wrong you did, how much wrong you commit. We just don't want that. It's good that we have Yom Kippur to wake up and say, yeah, I didn't do it. I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Man, that's a good thing to say. Remember when you're teaching your kids and they did something wrong. And some of them are more quick to say, oh, sorry, Dad. Sorry, Mom. And others say, yeah, well. You want to slap them and say, pardon me, you don't want to slap them. (laughs) If your brother hears you, you have won your brother. What a great line that Yeshua gives. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians. Better to be defrauded. Better to be wrong. Better not to live in the self-satisfaction. It's almost masturbatory of being wronged. Just being right. Living in that right. Verse 8. On the contrary, you yourselves are wrong and defraud. You do this even to your brothers. And then he goes through a list similar to what he gave us last week in chapter 5. We started with the sex sin of fornication. And what was the Greek word of fornication? Pornos. It's the same word used for prostitute down the road here in verse 16. That the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And you could read this and think, "Uh uh-oh, I'm one of these unrighteous. I mean, look at these things. Oh, fornicate. Well, I might have done that. Idolater. Yeah, well, adulterer. Yeah, I might have. Effeminate. Homosexual. Okay, that's out. Good. I didn't do that one. Thieves. Yeah, I did steal a few things. Covetous. I described it last week. I don't covet, but if I did, that's the kind of house I would covet. Drunkard, well, maybe that one night I lost it a little, you know. So you start looking at this list and you think, "Uh uh-oh, I'm not righteous because the unrighteous is this list. And so the apostle has to quickly get it into you that verse number 11, you were like this. Such were some of you. This was your character. This was your nature. These aren't incidental sins. Getting drunk once doesn't make you a drunkard. Drunkards get drunk. I understand that. But getting drunk doesn't define you as a drunkard. Lying once doesn't make you a liar, but liars always lie. Does that make sense? So these are character traits. These are persons who live in reviling or drunkenness or swindling so much that they are called back. You know that guy who's cheated the guy down the street, and he's cheated my cousin, and he's cheated my uncle Mordecai. He's going to cheat me. That's who he is. And so the apostle here says, you were like that, some of you, but now you're washed. Now you're sanctified. Now you're just as if you'd never sinned. That's what justified means. Declared clean, righteous. You're in the saints. You're wearing the stripes of the, not St. Kilda saints, but the heavenly saints. We're saved. All of these sins, and we talked about the sexual sin, we talked about some of these others last week, especially reviling, coveting, and swindling. And so he's pinging this so that you don't just get off on one sin. Anything you break God's law about is wrong. True? And if you continue to live in those, you become like that in your nature, and you become known as Bill the Crook and Fred the Covetous. So stop yourself before you get into this. The question in verse 9 has to do with effeminate, and effeminate doesn't mean a guy who swishes a little when he walks or does ballet. It means a guy who is sexually out of bounds. And we can see that back in the book of Leviticus, that you shouldn't lie with a male as with a female. That's what it's talking about. And perhaps it's pedophilia. Perhaps it's the men with boys. Lambda, lesbian, and I forget what the acronym stands for, but it's all about men taking young boys in and making them into eunuchs and making them into sex slaves and that kind of thing. So that would be similar to, but on the front edge of the next one, which is homosexuality. All of these are sins. They're none of them the worst sin. They're all bad sins. They're all wrong. Thievery, covetous, etc. You were, so now stop doing it. And I like that. I remember a controversy I had with a woman who was a married woman who was kind of going out on the town a little bit, kicking up her heels a little bit. I remember encountering her and she was on her way out to whatever, or coming, I don't know where it was. That's a little foggy to me, sorry. But I do remember this phrase that I used to her. Who are you? You know, you're a married woman and got a husband at home and kids. And I challenged this woman on her, who are you? So that she could live in proportion to, in relation to who she was. If you are a believer, then live like a believer. And if you're not, then go live like a hellion. But a believer living like a hellion makes no sense. It's like looking in the mirror and saying, oh, I guess I'm not a werewolf. Right? You're not. You're a human, so live like a human. No, you're a male, so live like a male. You're a female. Live like a female. Live in who you are. And Paul's going to appeal to that in chapter 7. Again, so next week we'll get to that a little more yeah. fully. Can I just ask something that is written in the Old Testament? They say, well, 
this is done in private part and we don't have to do anything from the old one. So in this instance, all these things they mentioned in the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah. So, right. Well, so welcome to Jews for it. Jesus, where we accept the Older Testament as part of the same canon, same book, same Bible. And what God said there wasn't a, oh, never mind, when he got to the Newer Testament. No, it's all one book, one package. And Paul is constantly appealing to, even as he does here at the end, with the woman, to join to a woman, because he quotes Genesis, they too shall become Basar Echad. So it's very confusing for me when, when it suits that uh, they didn't pay the price, that's why we don't need to do this and that. Yeah, that's not what he paid the price, to absolve you of any activity that's consistent with Older Testament Jewish life. He didn't say, okay, I'm going to die for your sins, meet me at church, we'll have a ham sandwich. He didn't say that. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He didn't say, yeah, never mind about the first 39 books of the Bible. So why Paul, well, actually, when he was sitting in one Jewish people, he was one Paul. No, you don't know that. That's what somebody has filled in the gap in the book of Acts with. The controversy between Peter and Paul was something very distinct, and that's not it. And it was more about Peter than Paul. But it's a question of halakha, really, of how to interpret biblically other Bible passages. And we always let the Bible interpret the Bible. That's a safe way to go. True? Look, he's going to...